the world wide web is gray. But you, you make me celebrate. Yes, I love technology, but not as much as you, you see. But I still love technology, always and forever. Hello, welcome back, True Seekers. I'm very excited to have you here today. I've got one of my uh, favorite, well, at least for the moment, my favorite authors that I was uh, just introduced to last year. She wrote The Trail of Tears, which was an excellent book, and then just recently came out with Be the Parent, Please. This is Naomi Schaefer Riley. Naomi, welcome to the show. So great to have you. Thanks for having me. So uh, it says here you're a New Yorker. Are you an original cosmopolitan New York girl or are you a transplant? I'm a transplant. I'm from uh, Massachusetts originally. Oh, great, great. So uh, just so people know who you are, I know you're currently a writer for the Washington Post and a former editor of the Washington. Sorry. Did I read it wrong? Sorry, the New uh, York Post. Whoa, whoa, big yeah, difference. Yeah. And right. uh, a former editor of the Wall Street Journal. I also uh, caught one of your columns recently in USA Today, which I really, really liked. So uh, give us some of your other credential chops. What else have you been doing? Uh, well, I, I basically am now a, I'm a freelance journalist. So I write for a lot of places, including the Wall Street Journal and sometimes the Washington Post and sometimes the New York Post. Um, and, uh, and I've written a number of books. Uh, and this most recent one uh, is, tells you a little bit more about my uh, my personal background. I'm the mother of three children, an 11 year old, a nine year old and a five year old. Um, and uh, I live in the suburbs of New York and, uh, you know, just try to balance the whole career and family thing. So here's what's really funny about this. Um, I had actually been talking to my wife about six months ago before I knew that you came out with this book. And I said, the one thing that's really interesting about technology is I feel like when you become a new mom, or in my case, a new dad, you can go to your father and or your grandparents, and there's all this collective wisdom about how to solve certain problems, right? I mean, it, there's a certain age where my parents were idiots, and I thought they were useless and didn't know anything. <laughs> and now we're coming full circle. And I realized there are certain problems they can't help with, and you kind of line them out here. So that's the first thing I thought was ironic about this, because we're the first set of parents ever in history who are going, we really don't know what we're doing here, and no one can help us. And we can't even agree on what's good and what's bad, and we're dealing with it in schools, and you break down everything in this book, which is why I think people should run out and grab it. But the second thing that I find, how would a social justice warrior say it, problematic is that uh, – I couldn't write a book like this because I feel like I'm going around in my mind telling people how to be parents, but I never want to voice it. I think as soon as I start writing this, I'd get myself in a lot of trouble. Is that something you dealt with introspectively? Like, was there any dissonance there for you? Um, you know, it's definitely the case that I think this is probably um, more personal advice than I usually give. But I am a journalist, and all of the the advice that I give in this book is based on my interviews with other parents, with parents who are older than me, with researchers, uh, with teachers, uh, and with doctors. Uh, you know, who I think I finally sort of got to got to them to tell me, you know, what they thought honestly. I think it's very hard. Uh, everybody, as you said, is very reluctant to to tell people their opinion. And even, you know, even pediatricians are very reluctant because they don't want to sound too judgmental and they don't want to, you know, mom shame, which is, you know, the worst thing you can do these days. And so they kind of hold back, I think, their honest opinions about what this technology is doing to kids. And I really pressed them. I said, you know, look, I just I want to know, you know, what is the research showing so far and what would you do about your own kids? And a lot of them said, well, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get into the mom shaming, but I really do think a lot of parents need to cut back and and they see all the the problems that come from this, the attention problems, the physical problems, uh the problems in school and uh you know, and I think if you really press them on it, they'll they'll give you honest answers and that's what I try to provide here. So I've got a lot of notes and things I would like to know uh, and kind of get in your head as the author, but before I do that, when you're writing the book, I know you learn a lot and you discover a lot. You've got a lot of research in here and you do cite many other authors who've done great work. What's What chapter or what part of the book kind of surprised you as the author and as a mom? What did you write and say, you know what, man, I'm, everyone's going to need to know this? Um, I think I was surprised by how thin the research is on technology in schools. I, you know, I think I was aware for a long time that, you know, classrooms have increasingly been using, uh, you know, first it was computers, then it was laptops, and now it's tablets. Um, and now 
teachers are even encouraging kids to use their cell phones in class. And I thought, you know, well, there must be something suggesting that there is educational value here. And I have to say that among the studies I looked at and the experts I talked to, there's really no long term, uh, you know, big study that shows that technology on its own can really improve educational outcomes. And we are investing so many billions of dollars, whether it's public school districts or private schools. Um, You know, sometimes obviously they're getting this technology, you know, for free in a pilot program from the folks at Silicon Valley, but it's really to get your kids hooked on it. Um, And there's this vicious cycle going on. You know, a lot of the schools are bringing parents in for parents night and saying, look at our shiny new products. Um, And parents somehow feel comforted that their kids must be getting the best education as a result of this. And so they're, you know, they're thinking, oh, well, you know, I'm I'm, I'm getting a great education for my kid. But really, uh, the research, like I said, is very thin. And it was surprising to me just how much time and energy and resources we're investing in educational technology before the proof is really there. That's great. I was hoping you'd pick something else than the one I picked. This is from your <laughs> oh, chapter. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. The highlighter and everything. Yeah. Well, I, if I get the full line, that means that's a page we got to talk about. So that's from uh, chapter six. You think education can't get worse? Question mark. And that was my absolute favorite chapter <laughs> in the book, too. And you don't just make the point that we don't really know. You mentioned the doctors and teachers and all the competent educators out there not only don't know, they're not admitting they don't know. They're not telling parents, or they're not kind of caught. Let me back up. I read Jordan Peterson's book recently. One of the 12 rules was um, treat yourself like someone that you care about. Or I, I'm going to mess this up, but treat yourself like someone that you're really trying to help, right? Instead of helping everyone else in the world, start here. And that's really the first job of the doctors and educators is do no harm. And you kind of make the case that they're just running into this head first with their eyes closed because everybody else is doing it. And then in another chapter, you kind of make the correlation that they're, they're treating you, you argue that, uh, in the old days, kids served a very different purpose and parents didn't use them as tools to show that they were competent adults. And that in schools, we kind of get caught into this, uh, crowd, crowd mentality of doing the same thing with the big shiny objects and the glitter and kind of the same way that marketing and television and everything else attracts our attention. And we lose focus of what our central role and uh, what our real job is. So can you actually, let me, before I ask you to extrapolate on that, there's one other thing I want to touch on is the, uh, I read someone that you know very well. There's a book called uh, Stop Helping Us about what happens when we overcorrect for minorities. And you talk about this in this book too, about how screen time is negatively affecting minority children and students. So that's not really a question, but kind of break that open for us. Right. Uh, so, I mean, I, I want to just say first, because I should have I should have said this earlier. I mean, the, the tone I try to take in the book is really uh, one of sympathy. I mean, I am sympathetic to parents who are getting all of this feedback from the culture and from their schools that their kids need technology in order to compete and in order to, you know, deal with all of the things that they need to deal with in the 21st century. I mean, we're, we're in a culture where you really can't avoid this. Everyone around you is doing it. And I think, you know, I certainly as a parent have felt a lot of pressure in that direction. And I, th- I think what I try to do in the book is show, you know, no, this is not all your fault as a parent. And I'm not just standing here in judgment of you for handing over your iPhone one too many times. Um, but I think that, um, you know, with regard to, uh, you know, technology generally and technology as it affects our, our most disadvantaged kids, I think we need to just be much more honest. And um, you see educational technology being pushed into uh, the lowest performing schools as the solution here. I mean, um, many years ago, I did a Big Brothers Big Sisters program, and uh, there was a, a girl uh, that I was paired up with, and I remember she was at one of the worst public schools in Brooklyn, and I remember her coming home and telling her mother, uh, and the teachers told her mother that you know what they really needed to improve her performance was to get a computer for their home. And I just thought, you know, this is this is not it. And and you could see because, you know, they proceeded to purchase a, a another computer and and what it was being used for was not educational purposes. And it was very clear that the computer ended up serving much more as a distraction than anything else. And I think that what the studies show and what the research shows is that uh, the lowest performing kids are actually going to be the most distracted by educational technology. Um, but it's not just that. It's, it's outside of the classroom, too. I mean, there are attention problems that are created by these phones. I think that often the parents of these kids are doing – 
um, the least to monitor what's going on on social media for these kids. I mean, you know, if if you are a working class parent and you are, you know, juggling multiple jobs and have other things going on, it is very hard for you to do the kind of monitoring that I think more middle and upper middle class parents are trying to do. Um, but the, the effects are clear. I mean, if you look at uh, just the amount of TV and screen time that kids are consuming by race, it is much higher among uh, our racial minorities and much higher among lower income families. And um, you see a higher rates of attention deficit disorders among uh, kids who are black and Hispanic. Um, and nobody ever says, well, maybe that's because they're consuming uh, hours more television per day than their white peers. And that's that is a real problem. I think we're not being honest about, um, you know, about what's going on here. There's a new campaign uh, that just started yesterday. I think it's called Truth About Tech, uh, where a bunch of former uh, uh, Google and Facebook executives are trying to tell uh, the, um, the, the, the current Silicon Valley executives that they've made their technology too, too addictive for kids. And I would say, you know, it's great that we're telling some truth about tech, but I don't think we're telling the whole truth about it. Uh, yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up, actually, because I had a couple notes. It's uh, Tim Cook, CEO of Apple, has said that he won't let his nephew use social media. I think uh, I don't remember how many names there were, but I saw half a dozen people who basically were in charge of the psychological weaponry behind these tools saying, you know what? We were kind of the Jurassic Park moment. Like, we're so focused on whether or not we could, we didn't stop to ask if we should, right? And now yeah. we're not really thrilled with Frankenstein's monster. I think that's fascinating. These people are the best and brightest in their industry, and they're saying, you know what? As designers and you as parents, we're just telling everyone to slow down. And I think your book's kind of the, – the timing is prescient because that's – for me, that's your thesis is we don't really know the answer to this. So we need to stop foisting on people and just hoping for the best because the evidence is showing us that it's not there. I think you make the case early that the only study we can really go off of is the effect that television has had on our children. And since the 1950s or 60s – and by the way, it looks like education and sizes of families have declined since the 1950s. And as Thomas Sowell has said, if we looked at the state of education since the 60s, if we're aliens from outer space, we'd have to assume that the objective was to wipe it out and to totally destroy it. And I think you make a pretty good case that technology is not helping. Right. I mean, what's interesting about all these Silicon Valley people is I think that they've known this for a long time. I mean, there was a famous interview just a few years ago with uh, Steve Jobs, who said he doesn't give his kids iPads. Um, and this was shocking to a lot of people. Bill Gates and Melinda Gates have said that they haven't they didn't give their kids uh, phones until they were 14 years old. Um, so I think that, that it's not just that tech. Uh, entrepreneurs have suddenly woken up to this and now are warning everybody else. I think they've known this for a long time. And if they're at all good observers of their kids, they've known this. They, a lot of them, you know, there was a story in the New York Times years ago about how a lot of them send their kids to what's called a Waldorf school, which is specifically a low tech school. There, there are no computers in classrooms in these schools. There are other uh, other aspects of them that are interesting too. They do, um, you know, more nature stuff and more drama, whatever. But the point is, they don't have computers, and the kids are not allowed to bring cell phones to school. So I feel like what I'm trying to do here is kind of let everybody else in on this little secret, and they're finally, I think, starting to do these mea culpas about, well, maybe we went too far. Um, and I would. Add with regard to the research, you know, it's crazy. I mean, parents, um, you know, they won't buy, you know, pajamas for their kids unless they've been tested multiple times to make sure that they're not flammable and they won't buy car seats unless, you know, they're the safest car seats on the market and all of these things. But with technology, it's like, oh, sure, let's give it a shot. Why not? Throw something at the wall, see what happens. Yeah, I heard Shapiro say that for decades we, uh, we smoked cigarettes without worrying about the carcinogens and now we're doing that with media and I thought it was a pretty good point that we we don't we don't give nearly enough regard for what those things are going to do in the long run. And so there's a lot of other examples you give in the book, but I thought it was funny that when you talked about tech, to me, it almost seems like a little bit of hashtag me too, right? This has been going on for 20 years now. And now these people are coming back and going, you know what? Yeah, we did know. And now we feel really bad. So as a parent, how do you inoculate yourself? How do you get away from that? You've got a lot of great ideas in the book. Why don't you summarize a few of the biggest takeaways that people are going to get when they read it? So I think the first thing, I mean, I wrote some uh, a column at the beginning of the year where I said, look, a lot of us really do realize that we have to cut back. And the question is, you know, what strategies should we use? So the first, you know, analogy, I think that's the easiest to think about is just using, is thinking about it as a diet. And, you know, like any diet, you have to be consistent, especially in the first few weeks and first few months. Otherwise, uh, it's going nowhere. And so if you announce to your kids, uh, you know, we're not going to have screen time during the week, for instance, which I think is a great rule, um, you know, after three 
three days, you know, when something comes up where you have to do some work or something, you know, or, or you need to get dinner on the table or something and you make an exception, um, it's, it's going, you're not going to get anywhere because your kids are, no, they know, <laughs> they're very clever. They'll be like, aha, we see the weakness. And the next time you have to do work, the next time you have to make dinner, the next time you have to do anything else, your kids will be like, now can we have it? Can we have it now, now, now? And they'll just, they'll wear you down. Um, but, you know, we have all sorts of rules for our kids. And if we're consistent about them, your kids will not bug you. I mean, your kids bug you every morning and ask for chocolate cake for breakfast? No, they do not because they know it's a rule in your house if it has to be said, that there's no chocolate cake at breakfast, generally speaking. So I think, you know, we, we need to think about this in the larger framework of parenting. And similarly, you know, there is a lot of pressure out there uh, from from other parents uh, to, um, you know, to give kids technology. Um, but I would say I interviewed parents across the country who had reasonable rules and were much more restrictive. And I would say, if that's your goal, you need to find those other people in your community, because it's very hard to do this alone. I think, you know, you're, you're kind of trying to parent in a vacuum, and you're setting up kind of unnecessarily and un, un, unrealistic expectations for yourself. Um, one other tip that, that always shocks people, um, you know, the, the typical answer when you ask people why they've gotten their kids a phone is, oh, I need to, you know, coordinate something. I need to coordinate pickups from soccer practice or, you know, the party or something like that. Um, and I say, you know, look, have you thought about what your parents did in this situation? Because this is crazy. You've gotten your kid basically the smartphone, unlimited access to the Internet. And what you really need to get your kid is a watch. You know, meet me outside swim practice at five o'clock. Here's a watch. Figure it out. I'm not an Uber. You know, I, I it, it, it amazes me. And, you know, and then parents says, well, what if happened? What's something? What, what if something goes wrong? And you say, well, then that person, that kid who you've presumably left with a responsible adult or 50, um, you know, needs to go up to that responsible adult and say, you know, something's happened. I need to call my mother and, you know, tell her that something, 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 you know, that I, I you know, I'm running late or that I forgot my bathing suit or whatever it is. Um, but the idea that you need to hand your kid an iPhone for that purpose just seems to me, you know, we're, you're, you're solving a problem that's not really there. What is the name for this phenomenon of what if something goes wrong? Going back to the pajama uh, the analogy you gave earlier, you're right. You drop them off at a public education house where they spend eight, year, eight hours every day and it comes out of your public tax dollars and your argument is what if something goes wrong? I'm going to give this kid a tool, of, a weapon of mass distraction where they have access to everything from Pornhub to Netflix during school hours and then ask the question, well, what if something goes wrong so I can justify my decision? What do, is there a name for that psychologically? No, I mean, I would say it probably stems from the helicopter parenting phenomenon, which is this desire to, you know, you want to communicate with your kid all the time. I mean, I'm on these mommy, you know, mommy groups, and people regularly post, like, what's the best GPS to put on my kid's backpack? And you're like, I, you know, look, this is crazy. I mean, probably a you, New York thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm weird. not. No, it's not even just a New York thing. I think it's a sense that, look, even if your your kids are at school, people have this, you know, obviously fear, you know, that is stoked by all these media stories about school shootings, about just anything under the sun that could possibly happen to their kid. But the question is. Do you trust the adults that your child is with? And I think that that's the fundamental question you need to be asking yourself. If you're dropping off a young child, you need to ask yourself, like, do I trust the adults around them to make them these, this decision? And even when they get older, I think, you know, that that's a question. Like, do you trust them to be able to make these decisions? And having a phone, you know, where they're constantly talking to you about these decisions, I don't think is producing the kind of independent, self-reliant kids that we want. And obviously, the vast majority of the times, the phone is not being used for that purpose. I mean, I was with a, a group of mothers recently around lunchtime, and this mother's phone started, you know, lighting up. And she was so excited because her daughter was texting her in the middle of the day um, to tell her about the different school drama. And she want you know, the mother was so excited. Oh, she's telling me about this friend and this friend. We have this great relationship where she can reveal all this stuff to me. And I just thought, this is crazy. Your daughter, this is the middle of the school day. And your daughter is not, it's not that she's in class. She's not, she's not present, you know, socializing with her friends. Instead, she's texting you updates. And I just, I find that crazy. So two things. One, I want to talk about the study where the, I think it's in Maine, where the every kid, it's a one-to-one -one ratio for iPads and what they learn from that. But two, you mentioned Bill Gates. I remember when that story came out, I was with my friend. And he goes, can you believe Bill Gates doesn't give a kid a phone until they're 14? And I said, well, it probably took him, like he probably said 10, and it took him a couple years to convince them to use a Windows phone. So I actually think there's something <laughs> going on there. Uh, they're like, fine, dad, I'll have a driver's license before I get a phone. We'll take it. 
you talk about the school policies and how they rush into these and it's a eight or nine billion dollar industry to get technology in front of these kids. And there's only so many vendors who are too happy to take the money and say, look, this is going to fix your problems. And I've seen this. I was really glad in your book you talked about how sixth grade is kind of the age when they should start using screens. I forget who it was that that's the, the age they go off of and they're very successful because my kid now, my oldest is seven. So obviously I was very selfishly interested in this book. Uh, but he comes home with these computer games that are basically just flashcards. And you mentioned the rocket ship and the frogs and all the, the cool animations that kind of distract him from the fact that he's learning math problems. And I look at that and go, is this a good thing? Like, I'd rather just do this with him and try to advance him, try to outcompete all the other kids in the class. But go to this example of the one-to-one and kind of the experiments they did where they segregate them based on uh, allotment of usage of the tablets and what the kids were doing and how well they succeeded with that. So um, the state of Maine was, I think, one of the first to adopt this one-to-one iPad program, which means one iPad per student. And um, the, the, the overall data shows absolutely zero improvement in educational outcomes after 10 years. So I think that that is the most important thing. But then I was reading this book, which came out last year called Substitute, which was by a novelist named Nicholson Baker that a lot of people may have heard of. Um, but he wrote a, a first-person account of being a substitute teacher in the Maine public schools. I think he did it for 30 different different days over the course of a year. And every time he walked into the classroom, the level of distraction that the kids were experiencing as a result of their iPads. So it started with, oh, my iPad's not connected, or oh, my, I can't access this particular thing, or oh, I can't, you know, there was always sort of a technological problem that needed to be solved. But then beyond that, you know, a lot of the kids were not, you know, they were not thinking about the answers to his questions. They were just looking up the answers online and then giving them the answers. And then, as if that weren't enough, then there were plenty of kids in the class who were just looking at things that were completely unrelated and some of them that were completely inappropriate. And so you ask yourself, like, do, you know, it's hard enough being the teacher to, you know, let's say 37th graders. Just imagine, I can't even imagine, I don't want to be a middle school teacher, but trying to get the attention of those kids. And then, in addition, handing them each a device like this and expecting them to pay attention to what you're saying, I just, I think the whole premise of it is absurd. And I think if any reasonable parent thought about it, they would agree. But instead, we're forcing teachers now to sort of go along with this because, again, you know, they're trying to impress the parents with the technology and the parents think that this is what their kids need in order to succeed. And, you know, I just wanted to, to t- sort of talk about that, too, because the pressure there is that the parents think that if they don't give their kids technology and if they don't give it to them early, then their kids are going to be at a disadvantage. That is the thing that I think we we really need to get around. Um, the, the Silicon Valley executives I talked to, again, they said, you know, you're so impressed that your kid knows how to, you know, swipe at the age of two and, you know, knows how to operate the iPad. Guess what? This technology was created so that two-year-olds can understand it. So let me just, you know, pop that bubble right now and <laughs> explain to you that this is, this is the goal. Um, and I, I just think parents need to understand that there is nothing about using flashcards with rockets or frogs that is going to make your kids any more prepared than using regular flashcards. And, you know, maybe it will incentivize your kids for five minutes. But frankly, I mean, I don't, I don't think there are a lot of games out there that really, you know, make your kids really, really want to do addition and subtraction in the long run. Uh, you know, unless they're already inclined to do it or unless, frankly, unless you're doing it with them. Uh, there's there's a lot to be said about, you know, you, you could use technology, but but what your kids really want is your presence. Yeah, and, my, and it's only, you argue, it's only too easy to shirk it and say, you know what, the tablet can raise my kids, just like we do with a lot of other things in life. But the, my watershed moment was when I read that someone, I don't remember how many years this was ago, probably a decade, that someone's daughter drowned in the bathtub while she was playing Farmville on Facebook. And I remember reading that and told my wife, I'm like, this is really sad. This is what Facebook was designed to do. It was designed to make it so that your world is insulated inside this little bubble where you're getting points for crops. And as horrible as I felt for that kid, I'm like, that's that's the day that I stopped using Facebook. And I'm not trying to be, that's the day that I made this decision. It's But I'm like, that's these weak moments reveal the character and intent of, of people's actions. I'm like, that's a powerful tool of mass distra- distraction. And when you were talking about the kids and the teachers, I have two things I want to share. One, I have a relative who uh, substitute teaches in the Anaheim School District, and she's retired. And in California, you get these outrage, these really generous pensions, but you have to maintain your hours every year to do that. So they have to go in 10, 15, 20 years after they've retired and teach a class every now and then. 
And I can't describe a more literal hell than what I hear back from these stories of going to a classroom 20 years later. And it, it was like a time capsule movie, like Walking Dead. Actually, Walking Dead is a pretty good analogy. And then she shares stories of other teachers. And they're like, it's almost not worth my $100,000 a year pension to have to do this for like five days a year. And, uh, and talking about how... I was a bad student. I'm sure, Naomi, you were the perfect student all growing up and the perfect child and <laughs> wife and everything, but I was not. I'm a much better student as an adult, but I still go into meetings and go into uh, coachings and go into executive level boardrooms with my laptop knowing that's my refuge in case the meeting goes south. Like I always have that parachute and that emergency hatch of I can get something productive done and it affects me to this day. And I looked at, I'm reading your book going, this is so true because this was my biggest problem as a student. Like I couldn't focus then. And now I have the choice not to in my professional life. Uh, thank you very much for helping me understand that that's not a good thing for my kid. If I can change anything about their youth, it would be, there are certain things you need to focus on. And this tool is to make sure that that doesn't happen. So we're that well, like you kind of gave me a little shot of steroids there as a parent. Like, well, a lot of college professors have actually banned the use of laptops, even in college classrooms, because they see the level of distraction. And there was an interesting study I came across that suggested that kids who take notes by hand actually retain much more of the material than kids who take notes um, by by typing it on a laptop. And it wasn't just that they were having access to you know other applications and other programs. It was also the way that writing forced you to actually synthesize the material in a way that typing did not, because typing your sort of more doing more of a transcription um, and you're able to capture a lot more of the words but you're not forced to sort of uh, you know figure out what the the most uh, the, the synthesizing the material most effectively so a lot of great stuff in the book I want to wrap up they said that your uh, your production team sent me a list of 10 tough mommy tips and one of the <laughs> ones on here I thought, oh, cool, I'm ahead of the game. Number 10 was ban the phrase, I'm bored. We've been doing this since our kids were born. No one is allowed to say I'm bored in the house. It's worse than, it's worse than any of the words that are verboten in the English language. And um, a couple other ones were deprivation is not sustainable. Substitution is. I love that. And it's okay to be a hypocrite. Thank you, because I struggle with that every day. I'm the world's <laughs> biggest hypocrite. So uh, in closing, what, are there any of those you want to break down as they pertain to screen time and uh, helping your kids develop? as uh, tools of productive citizenry and not just as a way to brag about how great of a parent you are by keeping them yeah. on the technological front line? I'll say on the deprivation front, I think you can't just, it's like the diet. You can't just take away the electronics and not do anything else. And so we spoil our kids in other ways. You know, we take them to bookstores and buy them lots of books and board games. And, you know, we buy them an inordinate number of art supplies. We go on shopping sprees at Michael's. It's a little ridiculous. But I think, frankly, it's a much better use of their time uh, to be doing those things. Um, but I really want to emphasize the it's okay to be a hypocrite point. Because a lot of parents, I think, feel paralyzed that they can't cut back on their their kids screen time because they look at themselves and they think oh I'm on the screen too much and you are and you should you True. know cut back and I you know I'm not kind of contradict that but we have different rules for kids and parents for all sorts of things we have different rules about driving about drinking about how late you can stay up all sorts of things about material that's appropriate for you and so I see no reason why we shouldn't have different rules for the the amount of screen time you can have and it's not just that parents have work that they have to do on their screens because sometimes that's that's obviously an excuse. But I think in our generation, you know, we have had the luxury of growing up without screens mostly. So we know what it's like to be able to sit on the couch uninterrupted and read a novel. And we know the pleasure of being outside in nature without, you know, our phone ringing at us. And we know what it's like to have dinner with our friends without the constant distractions. And what we need to teach our kids is how to enjoy those things too, to develop those tastes and those develop those habits so that when they're an adult and they are on their their screen way too much, they get this feeling like, oh, I kind of missed that, you know, when I got to be outside and they can put down their phones, you know, they, they will learn that kind of self-restraint and independence that our generation, I think, already has. Awesome. Yeah. As you talked about the diet in our house growing up, I think about it now as a parent, we had a basically an overnight rule. I knew that my mom was a working gal. My dad was always working. So, I mean, I was basically my young kids when I was eight or nine years old. I knew that nothing was going to stick overnight. The next day it was a brand new day. I was like Sun Tzu, right? And they were my total focus of warfare. It's just breaking them down 24 hours a day. And now that I have kids, I look at them like that. Like there were they're just studying me all day long and looking for weaknesses. So uh, I want to gloat over your book a little bit more. If you're watching, please go out and buy it right away. It's outstanding. And uh, if you're already the perfect parent, then buy it for your friends who you're already judging at the park and on the subway and everywhere else that need to read what's in here. Naomi Schaefer Riley, uh, love your writing. Thank you for joining me today and uh, wonderful book. So appreciate it. Thank you. It's great to be with you. All right.